Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the sixth annual presentation of this band of digital nomads. Um, <laughs> we've been doing this for a while, and it's our distinct honor to keep bringing you uh, cutting edge technological and pedagogical innovation for uh, early childhood classrooms. Um, we're each going to uh, give a chance to introduce ourselves um, prior to our presentations. So I'm just going to launch into things. Um, we just have a short period of time, lots of us here today, and lots to share. So um, if you have questions, we'll leave a little bit of time at the end. Or if something really important comes up along the way, thrust your hand up and we'll do our best to spot you. I'm an early childhood educator at uh, the Early Learning Community, and, which is outside of Portland, Oregon, and I have the great uh, pleasure of working with uh, some amazing teachers and wonderful students there. Uh, so much of what I will show to you today comes from the work that I've been doing uh, there in Portland, and if you're ever in the area, come visit us. So today, what I'm briefly going to go through is talk a little bit about teaching, very briefly, teaching, learning, and technology. Uh, and then I have a mantra for you. Uh, I'll talk a little bit and show you this hot new microscope. Um, talk a little bit about some uh, story-making apps. I'll do a little bit of a case study and uh, sort of summarize uh, some best practice uh, material. So, as most of you know, any good teacher begins a learning situation by asking, what is my goal, what is my objective, um, what are the tools that will best support that goal, and how can I use those tools appropriately to support the learning desires of my students? How can we use them intentionally? That's a word I'll keep coming back to. Really thoughtfully constructing how you want the learning to take place and the way in which you're going to use tools to support that. And then, what will it look like so that I know I have been effective? And those are the basic structures as you, as you enter any learning circumstance. So after more than a decade of careful and thoughtful work, um, uh, the revised joint NAEYC Fred Rogers Center position statement was finally unveiled uh, about a year, year and a half ago. Has it been two years? Yes. March 2012. Uh, okay, so there you go. Um, it has almost two years, but not quite. Uh, thanks to the work of Chip Donahue and R Roberta Schomburg and countless others, it's really this marvelous synthesis of research and development, pedagogy, technology, and at the core is this notion that digital technologies are another form of manipulative material that empower children's learning, and that child-initiated, child-directed, teacher-supported play with digital devices can serve as a powerful and positive learning experience. And the key to using these is that notion of intentionality. Uh, that, uh, and it's the same with any of the manipulatives we use. Teachers must consider whether their goals can be better achieved using this material or that material, traditional or technological, and whether the use of that technology or interactive media actually extends learning and development in ways that's really otherwise not possible. So here's my mantra for the day. Listen, go deep, and empower. Listen to the children, to all of their languages, written, danced, drawn, spoken, or acted out. Recognize what they are working on and look to support that work. Intentionally select the tools that will best enhance that work and then empower their learning by enabling them to do new things to push the boundaries of the possible and extend their zone of proximal development and enable transformative learning experiences. Now I put together on uh, a website that, that looks like this, and I'll, I'll blow it up, and at the bottom is the URL, tinyurl.com, and ECE Best Practices. It's a website that I've been developing over the years and I continually add to that has uh, video clips of ways in which to use a variety of tools um, with images, and as I say, videos, and description, lesson plans, um, suggestions about ways to use tools in a pedagogically as well as technologically powerful way. So I encourage you to go there, and uh, some of the examples I'll show today will be added there. So I want to start with uh, digital microscopes. This is what I believe is the quintessential tool for young children. Digital microscopes empower children to explore otherwise hidden worlds, 
and instantly reveal new perspectives through a tool they can manipulate in their own hands and share with others. There are a range of scopes currently available, and I found the ProScope line to be the most realistic tool for young scientists to use in the sense that they are really crisp, very professional-like images and uh, quite sustainable over time. We have some of the microscopes that are five or six years old that have been used in, in uh, slabbered on by uh, three-year-olds and stuck in ears and noses and all man manner of places, um, and they still work quite well. There are multiple types of platforms. There's wired or wireless and affixed. All require some kind of a computing screen and some form of light. So we found that setting them up in a uh, learning station with some specific realia, um, leaves or shells or some uh, crafted provocation can initiate some wonderful in investigations. So this is the wired scope, and in fact, this is from two weeks ago at my school. Um, needs a USB, you wire it to a computer, and um, the light is part of the scope, and um, it means that you have a learning station with uh, materials there, but it's not very portable. It does work really well as far as uh, pulling the trigger in and capturing photographs. We've presented before uh, on this particular tool. Um, last year I was able to bring to this conference the ProScope Mobile, which is a wonderful uh, device, has no wire, um, and it uh, connects to an iPad. In fact, it will connect to up to 256 iPads simultaneously. So one teacher can hold or one student can hold that, and all the iPads in the room connected through a wireless network can view the same thing. If one picture is snapped by that microscope, it goes instantly to all the iPads. And so you can see the advantage of a situation where you're trying to share with large groups of, of uh, children, or as the far left picture shows, one child is, is outside or somewhere looking at a particular um, piece of nature and uh, the, the children next to them all get to view that. But what I'd like to show you, to you today is the ProScope Mobile. Uh, and so here's the best way to do that is I have one with me and I'm going to plug it in. Okay, so uh, anyone have an idea what that might be? Close. It's a $20 bill. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Now you can pick where you want to focus. You just touch the screen. It focuses there. I can zoom in. I can zoom out. Um, here's what a leaf looks like. Again, zooming into a leaf. This is, um, I'm going to plug this back in. I just wanted to give you a brief um, demonstration of that. And um, Can I have my $20 back? No. <laughs> uh, over the years, I'm now about $100 up on um, This is what the microscope looks like. It's a tiny little piece, just like this. It has a sleeve. The sleeve goes on an iPad. And this particular scope can attach to a number of sleeves. So that's right. Here is my... Uh, my iPhone, and now my iPhone has just been turned into a microscope. And so it can be carried around. In fact, these are used by crime scene investigators because of the quality of the image that's portrayed. They're $150, uh, made in Oregon, all out of uh, American Oregon parts, and I think it's really a, a pretty spectacular new tool, quite a bit cheaper than some of the other um, microscopes that we've been showing you uh, over time. So um, let me talk a little bit about it. It attaches, this is the, the, the scope and this lens attach. Uh, it's 20 to 80 power, displays as, as a video or as a, um, uh, a, a regular image because it uses the camera app on your pad or on your phone. So it just displays the camera and you can uh, do what you would do with any image. Capture it, it goes to your, uh, your set of photos. Um, so one scope can use um, can be used for a, a number of different platforms. Mark, do you have any clear? No, you, just to be clear, you can use that on your iPhone or your iPad. iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch. What about Android? Uh, not yet, because it's a sleeve problem. The interesting issue is that this has to be within a couple of microns of exactly perfect, and so the. Um, the individuals, and I, I've met with the, the tech people in Oregon who are designing it, are in the process of creating okay. sleeves for it, but it has to be picture has to perfect. Be right. and, and it's, as I say, it's all done in the, the U.S. It's taking a little bit longer to get those sleeves in place. They should be out shortly. Okay. 
Uh, so these are examples of, uh, from last week in my classroom, students um, exploring uh, some of the realia from uh, our yard as, as the leaves are falling, the moss is falling, and uh, a ladybug and a spider came scrambling out of the moss that was there, and they were just fascinated with it. And so that's an actual photograph using this microscope of uh, a ladybug as the, the students were exploring it. Um, there was also leaves, and, uh, and let me show you the provocation that, uh, that I came up with. In what ways do the cells in a leaf look the same and different from the cells in you? And so this is an actual image of uh, a leaf, and here's the image of uh, skin. In what way are there similarities and differences between those cells? Anyway, um, it's the surface. It's the uh, like uh, plant. Those, those materials. What's that? It looks like a cactus, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> old and weathered, I think. Um, so, in summary, I think that this is really the, that sort of quintessential uh, tool. It's effective in supporting wondering, extending that authentic learning, empowering explanation, exploration, uh, and it really runs in multiple platforms. Okay, let me talk now a little bit about tablets. And you know, many years ago, um, uh, Seymour Papert talked about uh, computers as the children's machine. The tablet is even uh, more of that ch child's machine as it's portable, touch screen, can be used in a number of ways. In the years past, I've done some presenting on StoryKit, the power of taking that image that took, that, that picture there on the left, it took a child almost an hour to draw, encompasses a whole complex story um, but he can't really get that story because his small motor skills and literacy skills aren't powerful enough to, to be able to record it. But with an audio recording, he can share the fact that his sister would pick, uh, pick him up and they would talk together. Something that is a really powerful element of the story, but isn't encoded um, in the image. Another application is Doodlecast, and I'll show you in a minute um, an example of Doodlecast. It allows you to do drawing as a movie, and that movie records each of the keystrokes, and a child can add an audio narrative, and it has exportable video that's a step up from what you would get with StoryKit. Book Creator, on the other hand, is a little more complex of an application, but it's really very powerful in that it'll take photos or drawing or audio or text um, and video. save it in a lot of exportable formats, um, and it really allows children to create um, iBooks, eBooks that are really spectacular. Uh, and so the ability to tell stories through applications on an iPad, through these three programs, each which have different capabilities, are really powerful. And now I want to share with you um, a story. Let me summarize first. So these applications inspire creativity, they extend learning, they support a variety of ways of visiting and revisiting, sharing at home, sharing on the web, creating connections between people, uh, and really uh, empower the narratives of these children. So now let me start with this story. Uh, this year, um, in uh, a, a beautiful fall at our school, and um, school started. And so this is a photograph, and I found this later, the second day of school. This is a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Luke. And uh, Luke, this is the second day of kindergarten. And this is a picture of him. He has a ship that he has built and this white thing. And we started asking Luke about this. That's the Titanic. And it's an iceberg. And we thought, well, that's fascinating. Well, this is what happened the next day, the third day of school. He started creating the Titanic once again, and the teacher, a um, uh, colleague I work with, uh, Asia Apple, was really um, pretty fascinated by this and said, well, let's see if you'd like to maybe write a story. He didn't want to write a story. His small motor skills were really unable for him to draw this or to do any writing. <clears throat> so he simply traced the outside, the outline of his ship and, and narrated some text to her that she wrote down. In fact, this was the sister ship Britannic, uh, the doctor ship. Um, and this is where the propellers are, and this is the hull, and various elements of this. Um, and so a couple of days later, this is a photograph. This is taken from our archives. We were not documenting at that time. Uh, this is him just simply playing. Notice he's actually parallel playing. They're both using the blocks, but they're, really, they're not working together. 
Most of the time he was playing in solitary play. Then we started noticing this. This is in the art room. That's Plato. Notice the four smokestacks. <laughs> okay. Then the subsequent week. Okay, there's obviously something up here. This young boy is fascinated with the Titanic. Uh, we saw him using the language of, of clay. This, I, this is when it really caught my attention. Okay, notice he's always by himself. He's playing by himself, creating these structures. And so at this point, I went and started talking to him and said, tell me about this story. Well, he's got two teenage sisters. They were watching the Titanic. He was fascinated by it. And so he started to learn everything he can. But he's not very social. He doesn't really have good physical uh, skills. Um, he's really challenged by what's going on. So he continues to make ships out of every possible place. So I bought him the book. Explore Titanic, uh, and the book has a CD-ROM. I did some careful research, has a CD-ROM, interactive CD-ROM with it, uh, that shows you images like this. It puts you on the deck in the wheelhouse, in the lifeboats, uh, down in the, in the hold, into the boiler rooms. It allowed him to explore, and this is what started to happen. Notice on the left, he has a group of children gathered around him saying, tell us about this, tell us stories about the Titanic. He has to use the mouse to navigate, so his small motor skills are starting to advance. Uh, and so then I was sitting down with him, and using Doodlecast, I said, so can you uh, describe uh, your story, what's going on here? So tell me what you're trying now. In the bottom of the ship, this is like when it's filled with water in the bottom of the whole plate. It's all filled there. The compartments are all slowed. How did that happen? By the iceberg. What part are you drawing now? The propeller. So notice the ability of this tool to allow How the child to draw that. the plates. So he's drawing the plates. He's got the, tech, the terms down. This is the anchor. Kind of get down. And the Titanic. Okay, and he anchor. goes on to describe all yeah, of the elements. Water. What I like best, I'll start listening closely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See? I'm going to do it Okay, so he's... He's narrating that story and does a really good job. There's also the um, uh, book creator there. A number of different ways he began to express himself. A few days later, I walked in, and this is what he was doing, and I thought, oh, maybe he's, he's sort of moved beyond this narrative he's working on. Um, no, these are the gears that will pump water out of the hull. Uh, and so outside, um, he was uh, manning the lifeboats. Um, and in fact, I wish I could show you more of this. What happens? I spurred by the hand of Sultan of Fulton. Her stop was. see in his dramatic play, he's also embodying this. So I sat down with him and asked him to show me um, uh, some further writing, and so he did, I don't know if you can read the words Titanic there, um, but this is the picture, after all of this, this is what he's now drawing. And so, again, I could ask him to narrate. Mm -hmm. There's these flags, mm -hmm. and here the captain rooms, this is the crew's so he's describing the furnaces down below, all the cabins, the flag. And if you were to ask him, as I did, you have three flags. Why three flags? One's the flag of Britain. One is the flag of the, um, the White Star Line. And the other is the flag from Belfast, Northern Ireland, where all the ships were built. OK. Uh, let me show you a comparison. The beginning of the year, and then after deeply delving into the use of these tools, lots of these explorations. Um, so in summary, this is a classic transmedia learning experience. 
Uh, and so what he's doing is, uh, and I want to point out that while he's using technology, this is not about technology. Uh, it's been the most successful learning experience because first and foremost, the teachers listened to the languages he was using. They provided him with a range of media access to explore and represent these ideas. There was careful and intentional selection of the digital materials that allowed him to go deep into the concepts that he was exploring and that empowered new ways of learning. And the results were conceptual, small motor, uh, physical, social, and many other dimensions. And so technology is not this sine qua non, the most important thing. Uh, it should be just another tool, just one more tool um, that you can use that will empower students um, to learn and to, and to tell their stories. Um, and so, uh, sort of in conclusion, listen to your students. Uh, all the languages that they use. Encourage deep explorations that empower their learning. When appropriate, use transformative technologies that will push the conceptions of what is possible, and utilize the guidance of that position statement and the great resources that are available to you throughout the field to innovate and to have fun. Thank you. I'm sure glad I don't have to follow that one. You can see why we love doing this together. Right. We get to hear each other's Mark stories. Mark gets better every year. <laughs> I keep practicing. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're going to go to Georgia. Now we're going to Georgia, yes. A completely different part of the world. Oregon to Different Georgia. part of the world and, and really a different take on using technology with young children. Uh, my name is Diane Bales. I am a faculty member in the Department of Human Development and Family Science in the College of Family and Consumer Sciences at the University of Georgia. I am also primarily a cooperative extension specialist in early childhood. And among other things, uh, what I do is to uh, work with a teacher in our lab school uh, in, a, begin, in the very early stages still of integrating and using iPads as, as a teaching tool. So the examples you'll hear from me are much simpler than Mark's. We're not to where you all are yet. Um, it, this is, but we, but you know, hopefully this will help you see kind of the growth in terms of how uh, we have, have uh, integrated this tool into the classroom. So uh, the setting in our, in our particular case is, the, is our child development lab on campus. Uh, this is a early childhood birth through age five program, uh, primarily made up of children from higher income families. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about families' perspectives on technology first. And so it's important to know that because the perspectives I'm talking about may or may not match perspectives of, of families from different backgrounds. Uh, the particular classroom is a mixed age classroom. Uh, all children are either three or four when the uh, school year begins in August. O over the course of the year, we have a range of three to five. Uh, and I'm working with a very experienced teacher, and he is actually the one who's taking the lead in all of this. Uh, and we are working with families who are very interested in children's technology use. So we have that uh, as, a, as a beginning point. And so part of what we have started with is connecting with families around this issue of technology use. We started off, I, I would say honestly, a little bit blindly. We introduced iPads in the classroom. We thought everybody would be on board. It's a great idea. Uh, we found out that families have a lot of um, perspectives on what they want their children exposed to. And that that varies from family to family, from classroom to classroom, from year to year. So uh, families' technology exposure varies, their familiarity varies. Um, some families are very eager for their children to be involved with technology, uh, but they need some guidance from uh, our teacher, we have found. The families who are the biggest tech enthusiasts, some of them want their children to do everything on an iPad. 
And it's the teacher has been the one who has had to say, this is an intentional teaching tool. We're using it in these kinds of ways. It, we're not going to get rid of all the books and just give children iPads. We're not going to get rid of the blocks and just have them you know, build things in, you know, with, their, with their fingers on the iPad. So um, the teacher has both had, to, had to, fa to balance family feedback with what we know is developmentally appropriate. Again, referring back to the technology and young children position statement. And also educating parents and educating families about what is developmentally appropriate and in some cases what is not developmentally appropriate, particularly when we get requests from families to integrate things that are not, do not fit with the goals of the classroom curriculum and of the, um, the early childhood program. So, so the teacher has had to really take on an educational role as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I read the position statement, and I read, I'm a director at um, the Goddard School, and I read the position statement and presented it to the owners, and their feedback was that the position statement said, said nothing. And I just want to tell you that after looking at this, I think the position statement says a lot, because you're showing how um, the technology used intentionally is, is helping the child to come out. And so, Great. And it may, but that tool may not make every child come out of their shells or discover other possibilities. So you're saying it, it, it can be... And, and I think I would speak for everybody here in saying that technology is, is a tool. It can be an effective tool. It depends on your educational goal. It depends on the child. It depends on the materials you're using. And it has to be used intentionally just as any other material is. We're, you know, none of us are advocating you know, just give children complete, completely unlimited access to technology or to replace other classroom materials or experiences with technology. So with your experience, that child just responded um, very well to it, but maybe some of the other children in the class responded more to blocks or something Absolutely, like it's, indi it's individual and differentiation is, mm -hmm. is a critical piece. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me talk just very, very quickly about how, where these particular families have fallen in terms of technology use and particularly their perspectives on their children's use of technology are, are very interested, interesting. So we surveyed the, pro the families at the beginning of the program. It's a very small sample. This is in no way representative of anybody other than the parents in this classroom, but uh, it does give us a little bit of information. And what this was used for in part was uh, for the teacher to then collaborate with the families to set up classroom technology use guidelines. So just very quickly, this is showing you uh, the kinds of technology tools that the, the uh, parents who answered the survey are using. Uh, the blue being uh, things that they're using regularly, a home computer, work computer, smartphone, a phone with texting capability, uh, and, and in some cases a tablet. Um, they were using, uh, do, they did not have as many ebook readers, um, kind of a variation in terms of digital cameras. More interesting is children's technology access. These are the parents' reports of what children have access to in the home. Um, and then this is parent, these are parents' reports of children's actual technology use. And the, the image on the left is actual use in broken down in hours per week, and the one on the right is ideal. I thought it was really interesting with this particular slide that the actual and the ideal pictures all matched almost perfectly. There were a few families who said we use technology uh, 11 to 12 hours per week, but then they show up in less when they talk about ideal. But there's one family that said their child was exposed to uh, technology 13 to 15 hours per week, and that that was ideal. So, you know, so families have very different perspectives on how much time spent with technology is, uh, is uh, uh, ideal. And again, this is, this group, this particular class, this particular year, and it's definitely not representative even of other classes in this program. One thing I thought was really interesting, we did, we did less of a formal survey last year, but we did you know, sort of informally uh, get some narrative feedback from families, and we, some of the differences we've seen Last year, we had a lot of families who used technology at home. A lot of them did. A lot of them did the pass back the iPhone and keep your child occupied in the car kind, uh, kind of thing. And children were very, very familiar with technology. This year, we have more parents who appreciate having uh, us having opportunities to use technology in the early childhood program because they're not exposing their children to it as much at home. 
We also had differences in perspectives about what to use it for. Uh, last year, they, uh, the families wanted us to use technology primarily for learning games. And this year was much more focused on creative and artistic expression. So art, music, uh, using photographs, things like that. Uh, last year's, America, yeah. Did, did you send them out a survey or you culled this from their own responses? Both, some of both. The, the, this year's group, we did a formal survey. Uh, but in both cases, it's, it's as much conversation with the, um, with the individual families and with the families as a group as well. Uh, and, then, and then the other big difference uh, between years, we had last year a group of families who very much wanted their children to play games uh, that included commercial elements, you know, games that were related, related to the latest movie or TV show or those kinds of things. And that's one of the things that the families we're working with this year just absolutely don't want at all. So based on um, some of the requests and the information we've gotten from these families, the families helped us create technology use guidelines for this class. Uh, and this, this is the 2013-2014 version. Um, honestly, if I had written the guidelines by myself, they probably would have been a little different. But um, you know, this is a, a way to get families engaged in this whole process. And so, um, again, they want us to focus on providing apps for children to use that emphasize artistic and creative expression. So lots of art, lots of music, uh, those kinds of apps. And to avoid those games with a commercial tie-in. So no Cheerios games, no Brave the Movie games, things like that. The other thing that's, that is interesting is they wanted some very strict limits on technology availability, and we had to negotiate these. We had families who wanted us to, use, to expose their children to technology no more than once a month, and we had families who wanted us to use technology for at least two hours a day every day. So, you know, so, so it took some negotiation, and what we've fallen on is uh, two, uh, a limit of two days a week, 20 minutes a day during work choice, free play time, uh, having, the, having the iPad available for child-directed activities. Uh, if the iPad is used in small group, which we do fairly often, then it's not available on that day during uh, free choice time. This might, as I said, might not have been my ideal way of setting this up, but this is a way to help families be comfortable. And the other thing that's, that's been really interesting and has been really beneficial, and Mark showed you some good examples of this, is in allowing and encouraging group use. Um, and this is the way that we have grown. We started out with the idea that if you have the iPad, you need to be working by yourself, and this is an individual activity. There are times when getting uh, children involved as a group is much more effective, and they're, you know, they're, they're uh, modeling for each other, they're sharing language. Uh, a lot of those other kinds of skills are, are being learned through the use of this technology. Uh, so the, the projects that we're doing, uh, I've mentioned the artistic expression through visual art and music during uh, work choice time. The other things that we have been doing, we've been connecting families to classroom activities through blogging, and we've been using guided storytelling to encourage literacy and to build connections among children. So I want to give you some very quick examples of both. And again, these are much less sophisticated in a lot of ways than what Mark has already shared, but they have been very effective with this, uh, with this group. Um, we've been doing some classroom blogging using Kid Blog, which is a very simple platform. Uh, we liked it for this purpose because uh, we're able to limit who has access to the blog. So we can invite parents, we can invite them to share the link with families, but it's not a wide open public blog, and particularly with uh, posting photos. Um, and so, so it's used as a tool for them to tell their stories of what they've been doing. Um, and this is one of my favorites. I don't know if I can see it well enough. Um, but uh, at the University of Georgia, ESPM College Game Day visited us back in September. Um, and uh, we won't talk about the Georgia football record since then. But um, this, was a, this is a big event. And the setup for the set of Game Day was a half block away from the lab school. So all of the classes of, you know, in the lab school, from the infants on up, went on a field trip to see the set. And this was the day before, uh, before the broadcast. But this is, um, and I don't know if you all can read it better than I can on my screen display, this is their story of what they saw 
um, at College Game Day. And so they, they, saw, they saw these classes, the babies were there, Anna's baby brother was asleep. This is the children dictating this story of what, of what they did uh, at College Game Day. And then, of course, it's been a great tool as far as interactive communication. And this is just one interaction that I had between, with the children in terms of commenting on this blog. Um, and I, I commented, this sounds like such a fun field trip. I want to know where you rode an elevator with windows. I need to go ride that elevator, too. Because they talk about after we went there, we rode an elevator with windows. And I really, truly didn't know what elevator they were talking about. And so they wrote back to me, Dear Dr. Bales, the elevator's at the parking deck beside our school, reports Finnegan. The elevator's on the outside, says Muriel. Thank you for your question. Please let us know about your experience riding the elevator. So of course I had to write back. I went back and rode the elevator at the parking deck. I was amazed at everything I could see. Thanks for suggesting it. It was a fun ride. So, and the kids are very excited by the idea that people are actually reading what they're saying and they're communicating back. And it, you know, it, it makes language meaningful for them, written language in particular. And um, so it's been, it's, we're just getting started, but it's been a very useful kind of a tool. The other one that I wanted to tell you about is our guided family storytelling, which we've been doing for a couple of years in different versions now. Um, what it is is an opportunity for children to tell story, share stories about their own families with the other children in the classroom. So typically what we're doing is uh, our te the, uh, lead teacher does regular home visits anyway. And so when he does a home visit, he'll take one of the iPads with him, and he and or the child will take pictures of the home, of the family. Sometimes it's the child, sometimes it's him um, collecting those photos. And then they'll come back and they'll select, arrange, and narrate those photos to tell a family story. And then the child gets to share that story with the other children during large group. And we've used a story kit that Mark mentioned. We've also used VoiceThread as the other um, app. And so what I want to do is to show you just quickly, if I can make the switch, um, a little clip of Enpong's story. And of course, my challenge is I've got to figure out how to get to my navigation is strange here, and so I'm trying to get to Safari and bring up and post. How do I do that over here? Oh, 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 oh. Mark's going to help me because I'm not good at navigating from up here. There we go. Okay. So this is a piece of Enpong's story. Um, Enpong was a, a little boy who came from a Chinese family and had recently come to be uh, a part of this classroom. Spoke very, very little English. Uh, his parents were faculty members. They spoke more English, but not a whole lot. But he had grown up speaking Chinese. So Enpong actually took these pictures. This is where he's living. Uh, I've, got a couple, uh, I've got a couple of others I want to show. And I want you to just, your, uh, just get a sense of what he's saying here. So, in Chinese, he's describing where he lives. And then I want to show you one more quick piece of this. These are, this is the series of photos. This is the view from his, um, from his apartment across the street. Oh my gosh. Well, show it's road and the and the tree. Oh, and the cars and and the cars and the cars and the doorway and the this and the number three and the, and the number three and the no moving. And again, uh, what's going on here is um, he is narrating the story. We're work he had a Chinese tutor who was working with him, and at that particular point, she had said, use as much English as you can, please. So you heard him start out with, oh my gosh, trying to figure out how to do that, and he'd used a little bit of English, and then he'd slip back into Chinese. Um, and um, let, me get, let me play this again, because there were some really interesting outcomes, particularly with this child's, um, child's story. Some of what was going on, uh, when he joined the class, he was almost four, but because he didn't speak much English at all, he wasn't speaking to the other children. 
And so what was going on, the other children were treating him like he was much younger than he was. And they weren't engaging with him much. They weren't talking to him. When, when he recorded this story, and then they played it for the rest of the children, you could see the light bulb going on in their minds. Oh, he does know how to talk. He just uses different language than we do. All of a sudden, the children started including him. He started talking to them in a combination of Chinese and English. He started playing together. His English uh, development, of course, absolutely exploded as he was able to use language more. But it was such a powerful thing because it enabled him to connect, to show the children that he lives in a place very much like where they live. Um, and you know, he likes to do some of the same kinds of things that they do. So um, it was a powerful tool to really include him in the classroom. So some things we've observed so far. Children really enjoy sharing their family stories. Um, and hearing those stories encourages them to see the similarities between uh, children. That, you know, I live in a place that looks like this. You live in a place that looks like this. I eat pizza for supper. You eat pizza for supper and so on. Uh, and it's surprising the, kind, the things that children don't recognize until they actually are able to see them. Uh, we know that families are interested in the te technology use. They have their own ideas. Um, and, but the teachers are modeling and teaching developmentally appropriate technology use, not only to the children, but also to the parents. Um, and we found that blogging can be a very useful way to model meaningful writing for the children and having that two-way conversation with their families and with some interested others um, is helping them to really see that uh, blogging can be useful and that two-way communication can really make, uh, make that much more effective. And I do have to share this very own picture of me, but um, in particular, I've got to uh, give credit to Philip Baumgartner, who is the lead teacher in this class, who does the massive majority of this work um, and has been started out as a tech skeptic and uh, is being very careful and thoughtful and intentional in his own growth in terms of the use of technology. And so uh, we are nowhere near where, they, where Mark's crew is, but we're growing and we're learning every year, and maybe some year we'll be able to do things, the kinds of things you do as well. So I appreciate your, appreciate your time and your attention. Now we're going to rural Maine. Yeah, we come from all over the country. Tour of the country. We're going all over the place and working with all different kinds of learners. And, oopsie. Although we did just go to China. We did just go to China, that is true. We're going all over the place. Um, my name is Bonnie Blagojevich, and today I'm going to talk about a different kind of technology use. Um, Millbridge, Maine is a very small rural community, and um, this is a project, which I'll talk about in, in a short while, where the community is coming together to really try to support children before they get into kindergarten. Um, and that includes using technology to increase access to learning. I just want to mention that last year we told a range of different stories and that Warren has recorded those and they're up on the wiki. So we talk a story about technology as part of a project approach in a family childcare home to support and extend literacy opportunities and to support nature appreciation. And those stories are available on our wiki from last year. So if you want to hear those, you can check back. But this year I want to change my focus and um, as others have mentioned with the tech position statement, not only do we want to read it and um, let others know about it, but actually if you have examples from your own classrooms, I would invite you to start sharing them publicly because as someone had mentioned, um, people want to know, well, what does that really look like? And I know Mark has mentioned his examples. I use them in an undergraduate class that I teach so that the students can really get an idea of this is the theory of the position statement and what is the practice. I'm going to focus on recommendation number six, which is to provide leadership in ensuring equitable access to technology and interactive media for the children in their care and for parents and families, because there is an opportunity gap. One of the recent reports um, from uh, Zero to Eight, uh, from Common Sense Media, pinpoints that it's not only access to technology, because even though access may have increased from 20% of lower income children having tablets to 63%, <coughs> how they're being used is really very, very different. Um, in this case, 35% uh, 
have downloaded educational apps for their children in <coughs> lower income parents and 75% um, for higher income parents. So um, parents may need some information on how to use this technology to support learning and use it in intentional ways. The project I'm going to talk about is called Comienza en Casa. It starts at home and it's um, funded by uh, Maine Migrant Education and um, operated by a nonprofit, Mano and Mano. The goal of the program is to provide parents with information and tools they can use to help their child develop school readiness skills and contribute to their success in school and in life. And it's uh, started in spring 2012. It's a small project, but rich learning. And um, in this project, the, the parents and the families are actually agricultural workers who switch from picking, harvesting blueberries to um, wreath making and fish processing. So they're, year, they're there year round and they use and are able to borrow the iPads and use them in the home, as well as traditional early learning activities. So each season we offer three modules, so maybe there are three months and, and a different module each month, and a final celebration. And we have evening meetings held once a month at the local elementary school and a home visit after two weeks, and we'll talk about that. So really, each season or half year, there's really only nine hours we're directly with the family, so the iPad is providing some extra interesting educational opportunities, as well as the off-screen activities. When we did a unit this September on color explorers, it's not just naming colors, it's about uh, mixing in the art and science of color. And we always start with identifying what are our learning goals, and these are a few of the learning goals that we selected um, because the families, not all families, you know, children don't come with an instruction book and they're not clear on what does it mean early literacy or early math or early science. And if you don't know what some of those concepts are, how can you make those decisions about what apps to select or how to use the media appropriately to help children learn? So for every module, we'll have examples of ebooks that they can read with their child and we'll have games that the child and family can play together that allows them to have hands-on with colors and matching, maybe a matching game. Um, creating things, so moving from consumers to creators. And then because every child is different, even in this small group, you always have your children um, at different developmental levels, different ages, and so with the free play app choices, um, here that's a finger painting app and a chance to be a, a tailor and create, use colors in clothing design and actually embed that in your own environment, in your own home. And so by giving this range of choices, you're thinking about universal design for learning or how can you give them the most options so that everybody has <coughs> something that's gonna be a match for them. We always provide off-screen activities and we've heard some families, that's some of the most exciting things for them that they hadn't thought of doing some of these activities. So it might be, um, gathering recyclables and sorting them by color. If families haven't thought about sorting before or tried that with their children, trying those activities at home is very helpful. Color mixing with watercolor paints we provide or gathering um, natural objects and, and using those in color explorations. Um, tip sheets, we always also, if families haven't had the opportunity, you know, you might say read with your child, but sometimes there's a lot more information that's needed about why would you read with your child and also helping to make the connections with the technology and the learning pieces. And also vocabulary. You might say speak more with your child. Well, what if your own educational background was limited and you dropped out of school in fourth grade? Um, you know, you might want to have some more scaffolding around what does that mean? You know, what are color, you know, words and challenge words and mixing and blending? You know, what does that really mean? Um, we also have, after two weeks, the home visitor. There's um, Anna Blagojevich, the home visitor. And um, she goes in and she talks to the families and says, well, from these, let's revisit these learning goals. And about your child, what's worked for your child? And in the last two weeks of this month, what do you want to work on? So that the families are in the driver's seat. Because she said that's so important that families realize um, their role in supporting and guiding their children's education. And we talk also a lot um, about media diet and balance because we want, sometimes with the technology it feels like things get out of control and we want to feel we are in control and these are all parts of that conversation. You know, Anna has stated that parents really want their child to succeed and 
a parent comment was, because we really give some of the learning objectives and they aren't familiar with them, that helps provide that foundation for understanding what the technology and off-screen activities are trying to accomplish. And because they're making some choices about their child's next step, it puts them in a, in a very good role. So one parent said it was good because there was to read, to play, to do other things. So he's working on the same thing, but in different ways. So, so they're seeing that connection between what you hope your child will learn and, and what they are doing with their child. And when, on one of the home visits, we have been talking to the families about the importance of taking down the children's dictation and how you might do that for their, for their written stories. And a parent said, I would never have been doing this. I don't always get everything done, but I try my best and I tell myself and my husband, we have to make time to do these things because it's gonna help our daughter when she gets to school. So that when parents understand what's gonna help their child, they make it a priority. And you know, we have a range of families who come to us and with her, who have had a range of opportunities. And some families are very appreciative of some of this information. When we have our evening meetings, we do hands-on practicing with families. So the children have childcare, and we've um, started to partner with the elementary school, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So they will practice patterns with real objects, then they might use another app where you can, uh, a collage kind of app, where you can you know, 2D manipulate and make A-B patterns, and um, then you can actually put that into your clothing design. So we bring in those research bits because families need to understand, you know, why are you doing this, you know? And for example, frequency, talking with your child, you can say, speak more with your child, but when we bring in a, a tidbit that says, well, if you say something three times, it's 20% chance that the child will remember it, but if you say it 24 or 26 times, there's an 80% chance, then the child has some really important and research-based information that's going to help them in all of these projects. So we want the families then to understand things and then be able to bring it home as this child has made this paper chain at home using the patterns. And families share with us, because we do a checklist at the beginning and the end of the season, when we said we're going to talk about patterns, everybody looked at us and they really didn't know what we were talking, you know, what we were going to do. And we actually do this program in Spanish. Ana is fluent in Spanish, and we try to find apps, and we're going to talk about that in Spanish, because we want the children to be able to develop that world knowledge, you know, the word knowledge and world knowledge in their home language, so that then they understand when the teacher starts to do that in school, what's going on with sorting or patterning, um, but they do have exposure to English through some of the apps. And it gave us a chance to become more aware of things and learn alongside our kids like patterns. Knowing our child will need to know that when he goes to school. Learning how to work on that. So there are many families who really would love some of that information. You know, as we mentioned, research. Why is it important? Why are you supposed to read with your child? Why should you be talking with your child? Little tidbits from the best research, bringing that in. The parents have been truly fascinated and have really valued that. Um, you know, above is, is a picture we have the parents do a video reflection at the very end because they actually hand in the iPads and we are curating and putting on apps around a certain topic. And some of the topics are generated from feedback from the families about what would be really interesting. Um, this fall we had one on healthy choices, which had to do not only with um, nutritional choices, dental choices, but media choices. Because um, as the research mentioned, a lot of them were starting to get mobile devices, but people didn't know how to manage the apps. They didn't really know how to manage the apps, and they wanted some more information. The Fred Rogers Center blog um, is one that I highly recommend, and it's on my resource list. We pull information from there about media diet, and you know, there's healthy food, and unhealthy food, and healthy media, and unhealthy media, and we bring some of that really good information into our discussions. And then we problem solve with families and give in additional intervention if needed. If families aren't comfortable with reading themselves, and that happens, and many of the children, they were not regularly reading in the home. They may not have books in the home and may not be comfortable with text. Um, what are some of the supports and are there ways technology can help? 
This is Mrs. Hofsis, the amazing um, kindergarten teacher in Millbridge, Maine, who once we went to her to kind of find out more about what the expectations were for kindergarten to help us design what we were going to do for our families, she got right involved because she knows, actually in this little rural community, out of the, in the kindergarten class, almost half the children are from families that are speaking Spanish in the home. And she knows how important that early piece is and um, supports Anna's decision to try to start this program because by the time they get to school, it, it all, already feels late because they started off pretty far behind. So you can see she's done story modeling here. Hola, soy Mrs. Hobson, and I'm here to show you what it would look like if I was reading to your child in my kindergarten classroom. Y estoy aquí para enseñarles cómo se vería si estuvieron en mi clase de kindergarten cuando leían. You can get the gist of that. So she modeled animated story reading, and some of the family members, after they saw that, you know, were modeling how they actually went. They mentioned that the story she read at, at a health appointment, they were given free books and a choice, and the child wanted the book by that same author illustrator. So she, in that case, she didn't know what the book said in English, but she told her own story in an animated way. So that was truly valuable for her. In the school partnership, we moved into the Millbridge Elementary School as we were partnering with the teacher. And um, Mrs. Hofsis became more involved. You know, we would tell her what we're talking about. And when they actually heard their kindergarten teacher um, saying, and this is why this is important for when your child gets to kindergarten, that had an extra impact for them. And I wonder, really, how many schools are looking to partner with the groups that are caring for the children before they get to school? I always wonder about, about that. Um, and in this little community, we're able to start doing that. And there are child care and learning activities in the kindergarten room. You know, the dentist came recently and talked to both the children and families as part of Healthy Choices. So um, a lot of activities. And in this case, this was during the science unit. We were talking about ramps or another time about color mixing. So we introduced the apps and how to use them. We introduced activities they can do at home. And video modeling is very powerful. Um, and it's sometimes... There are really good resources being developed in English and Spanish, but to, it's important to also have people give permission to use them, to put them on iPads and use them in the home because the families didn't have internet access. So we're always looking for really good resources. When the families begin to understand the learning concepts, they go to town. Um, they were all having magnifying lenses, and they start moving off and on screen. So Sid Science Fair was one of the um, apps that they used, and there's a an activity with a magnifying lens and you examine things closely. And so these are some of the connected activities um, that they started to do. Um, in, in that same app, there's a sequencing activity where um, a banana ripens and their child didn't get that concept, so she got real bananas and lined them up and had the child draw it. So, um, you know, very powerful for the families. And then moving to creation, Book Creator is something that Mark had mentioned. Um, we like this app as well because you can put in audio and video. So again, none of the families said that they were really talking about the five senses with their children. And once we started to, to do that, um, they went around their own, you know, be it a trailer, well, here at the trailer, and found this is, you know, what I'm smelling. And their child could take the picture with the iPad and add the audio in their own language and create these personal books about five senses. And then they all, at the end, said that their child now understood about the five senses. You know, we say read with your child, and one thing we discovered related to the media is that um, we started off with, you know, we always offer ebooks and we always offer educational games and creativity apps. We started off with um, a very simple storyline that was very visually supported um, with, you know, Animals Twirl, and the first one is Bard Yon Dance by Sandra Boynton. And so um, we thought with all the visual supports, even though it's English, that that might be useful because you can pretty much see red turns red on the screen, you see the words highlighted, and you see animations that support the vocabulary. But that we decided that we really wanted the children to love learning and good stories, and we wanted to try to find an ebook that had a really strong storyline. I think we were doing families, and the frog thing was about a little frog, and he wanted to fly, and 
you know, that was a compelling story. In that time, it was only in English. But we then made a translation on a paper. So they got the storyline. We said, parents, read that over, please, and talk to your child as you go through the app. And they said the children liked the story because it was a good story, but I think that was still cumbersome. When, as things have evolved in app, in the world of apps, we started to see apps that, um, this is a Who Stole the Moon, that are in multiple languages. And they say, this is good. The family says, this is really helpful. I really like that you can do that. The same company that did a frog thing started to do a series with the Smithsonian, and as things have evolved, they have a record and share feature. So now, my son-in-law, who speaks Spanish, could record the entire story, and we were doing science, and this had a lot of good life cycle and different things in it about a fox on Hickory, red fox at Hickory Lane. And so he, in his narration, um, you know, they could access everything now. The words on the screen are still in English, but the concepts and the vocabulary are now accessible, and you can not only record that, but you can email that to somebody. So that means you could do that in any language. Yeah. I just had a thought, and I don't know if anybody else in here is like a preschool educator, but what about like we um, love the idea of inviting parents in to read a story, but they can actually read the story yes. at home yeah. and send it in for like a show and share Friday, yeah. and you can have your parent reading your story for your class. I think that was the intent. Is you know, someone true? far away, anybody could read this story and email it. Or if a parent is being, you know, going to be deployed or whatever, they can read that story and that voice. Yeah. Um, so and and we our our light bulbs went off because we said, whoa, you know, the families. The family said, now we can participate. We can talk about foxes and, um, you know, all of these are different kinds of genres. You have a repetitive book and you have a storybook and you have a more informational book. And all of those exposures are really important too when you think about reading. And then I, I put in um, the ABC, um, and the first one is farm, and the, the other one is their insects, because it has content knowledge. So if people are limited in the amount of knowledge that they have access to, um, if you don't speak the language, if you don't go to the library or know how to use that yet, you know, what are some different ways that you can access interesting facts? And you can toggle very easily back and forth between English and Spanish. And again, the apps have evolved. So some of their earlier apps, you couldn't do some of these things, and they have evolved. So here we have. Hmm? Sorry, what was the name of the app where you can read it in the email? Um, the Ocean House Media app developers, all of their apps now have this feature. <laughs> and actually, in our set of links, we put off all of our apps. So you don't have to like write up your apps, but you can either email me, but I have a list and a handout we have on their command at CASA site. So you can access a lot of our apps. And I have been guilty of not practicing what I preach because I've just started to think about how important it is to be sharing everything because we're a little bit behind in updating our website, but we'll try to get that going. We have some of things more from last year than from this year. But we'll put up all our activity sheets and our apps. It takes a long time to look at a lot of apps. And actually, I use, um, sometimes I, I look at video um, reviews like Warren and others do about apps if you want to look before you leave. And I also subscribe to some free app services like Smart App for Kids, where I can get apps for free. And then, you know, like there were five free dental health apps. So when we're studying dental health, I went and ended up with the Fred Rogers Center app where one little boy did not like to brush his teeth, and now he does because of easy grooves, was it? Everyday Grooves. Everyday Grooves is, a, is an app which got him excited about brushing his teeth. <laughs> so, um, library partnership time. Two minutes, okay. Um, we're excited now because um, we realized that the families were not using the library, and we had our final celebration at the library. Um, the librarian, Melissa, is excited about um, having people use the library. She doesn't speak the language. We got an, um, a grant from the University of Maine, and with that grant, we were able to get some iPads and apps, which will be at the library, which means not just the families eligible for our project, but other families in this rural community can come in and benefit from the program we lay out. There's a notebook with our materials, and apps will be on that. Um, and more families will have access to that. And we really want to move to the point of if the families do not know about, um, so the language with the new iPad, we put on a, a translation app. 
So there's one librarian, and she speaks English only, and so with the translation app, um, she can now communicate with the families because she speaks to it, it says it in Spanish, it may not be perfect, but they have a way to communicate. Um, the families pulled out the Spanish books and we're trying to build that collection so they have more access. And the siblings and other families would benefit. And we will continue to talk about digital, li digital literacy and media diet and try to get over the winter when there's not as much work, because the families work a lot, um, how do you use a computer, how do you use the internet? I mean, if you want to know about a worm, how do you help your child do that? And so um, those are important goals. I think I was very happy because one of our children going on to kindergarten, when his parents offered to get him an iPad, says, I don't want any games. I want the apps for learning. And if we have time, you can come up later, and I'll play you what he said, um, where he says, he's so proud of, what his, of his work. And you can see he's great. And he used to hide, I think, sometimes some of the children in the bedroom and watch the recreation of their stories and listen to their own stories, because it was so exciting for them. And resources, oops. Sorry. Hmm? All right, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm taking, I got lost here. But um, we, do, we are putting up our resources. We all met each other through the Technology Interest Forum. There is a meeting tonight. And um, there is other cool stuff that you will hear about if you join our group. We always learn new things from each other, be it robotics or um, a, lot, a range of other ideas. Go ahead, Warren. Pass me your graphics thing, will you? So, do you remember the name of the ship that Mark talked about? The Titanic, actually. And so, Mark reminded us the importance of going deep. And what a great metaphor for the Titanic. <laughs> and also the digital microscopes. And really, using the technology to open new worlds to children that didn't exist. And that's really why, why we're doing this. And then Diane talked about, you should, gave a demonstration of how you could turn this thing to, into a portal to China. And how a little child over there sees a backhoe out of their window and uses language and develops in talking and speaking and listening a lot like children in Georgia. <laughs> and. Bonnie reminded us that it doesn't just happen by accident, that it, you have to be very intentional. You can't just throw the technology at the problem. You have to get in there. And uh, another thing Diane mentioned was let the parents develop the guidelines and build that ownership. Um, Bonnie showed a parent who was, you know, made a parent into a movie star with iMovie. Probably and, the child did it. Yeah, and also, <laughs> in, in remembering the library. So, so um, that's me, good, okay. So let's get started here. Um, I'm gonna, um, been, I've been watching um, what's been going on since the past two years since the technology statement. And I went from being really excited uh, about um, where we were headed because, you know, imagine, innovate, and inspire, that's NAUIC. I've come to think that NAUIC is bipolar, <laughs> that this organization is, wants to do those things, but at the end of the day, puts out books that are scary about technology, and it's kind of like, there's something bad and scary, and so, um, Obviously, I'm a reviewer. I'm, I'm passionate about empowering children with whatever tool it is, whether it's analog or digital. And, but rather than lecture you about this, I decided to premiere a movie right here at NAYC. So it starts with this question, what is a screen? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the premiere. Um, we never know what he's doing. A new movie.
you very much. That was made in about 20 minutes with iMovie and took you around the world. That was some scenes from Scenic Hit in Amsterdam. The large billboard size screen was from Manhattan outside the Sony PlayStation introduction, which I found the kids playing outside were more interesting than the PlayStation 4. Uh, but the question is, what is a screen? Um, I, you know, one, one scene of that little girl painting with water, she was using a, just water, and the LEDs in the wall, uh, imagine if they were embedded in this, in this room, and you could go up and just touch the wall and their heat sensors and you could see, and the whole room could become a screen. So I, I um, wanted to make that movie just to expand the idea of that a screen is uh, kind of different than it was three or four years ago. Um, so as a reviewer, I wanted to get you smart really fast, and so here's, here's what it comes down to, folks. Let's get started. It's about the hardware. It always has been, and it's about the software, and it's chicken and egg. And so if you, to figure it all out, you, you, oh, and then there's children, right? And so to figure it out, you can look at the hardware. You can, well, what's new in hardware? There's new game consoles, right? PlayStation 4, Xbox One launches today. And those, what's exciting about those is they can see you. Both of them come with very high definition cameras, almost spooky. And so now the whole augmented reality um, it has taken a step toward what a young child can do because your motions, you can now compute by waving your hands. And so now there's gonna be new software. And of course, uh, there's the new iPad Air which I see no reason to have. It's just like the last one, except I just can't wait to get one. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's the new iPhone, uh, and there will always be another one. But the differences, as you are seeing, is they're narrowing. Uh, I encourage you to look at uh, this video. If you, if you Google LOT, L-O-T-T-E, this is the name of this little girl in Amsterdam. And this parent videotaped their, her entire life uh, sort of like Vine before there was Vine. So this girl is now 14, and you can see in two and a half minutes this development. And it reminds uh, you, uh, as, us all as early childhood educators, how much uh, influence we have over in the, be the beginning years. And so anyway, get back to task here. Um, more excitement uh, and more um, exploration of this, the dynamic that can happen in a living room. And what you're, you're going to start seeing about 20 to 30 different Android tablets for children, specifically targeting children. And uh, some of those are um, the Clickin' Kids tablet for 99 cents, there's the FunTab Pro, there's the Exo Learning tablet now sold in Walmart. Remember Nicholas Negroponte's $100 laptop? He meant $99. That's what it looks like. Yeah, and instead of, uh, yeah, I know. I put, I put those in there on purpose. Uh, so, uh, and then the Samsung Galaxy Tab for Kids is actually a wonderful tablet. It's, and Android is getting better. So this is good news because it's competition for Apple. Um, so, you know, in terms of software, what does this mean this year? Well, you should know that there's a gazillion apps. And, you know, they're, there's good news and bad news there, but the good news is that you have a lot to choose from, and you can pretty much type something into YouTube. Uh, and Chip asked me in a session before, you know, how do you, what's a good resource for finding uh, software? And what I suggest is just typing the, the title into you, into a search engine or into YouTube, and you can probably see it. And you know, the good news there too is it's 99 cents. It it's not 60 dollars anymore. So you know, give your teachers two or three hundred dollars, give them a gift card, it's worth it. They make forty to eighty thousand dollars a year plus benefits. I think you can give them a hundred dollar gift card to explore software and make some mistakes and start to develop their own sense of what's quality. Uh, that's important. Um, I'm happy to help as a professional reviewer too. You can hire my services, but I think it's more important to develop. Everyone, we all need to develop our lens. Um, and let's see. Uh, 
so the other thing, um, and this came up in this webinar I gave the other day, is that every theory finds a champion in technology, and that's never been more true. And out there on the floor of NAYC, you'll see top-down approaches where we'll sell you a tablet that's pre everything set up and we'll take care of assessment and so on. And then there's the bottom-up approach where um, give the give the teacher uh, a a device that can run tens of thousands of apps and let them figure it out as another material. And of course the correct answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, I kind of like the bottom-up approach myself and I like to empower teachers. And so part of that is to take Mark's microscope. So Mark's got this cool microscope. What do you show it on? Now back in the olden days, in 2010, <laughs> we used those projectors. But a better solution is um, these screens. So here's your $976 smart board, and the recipe is on this um, piece of paper on the chairs. Uh, instead of a smart board, you should have a smart price. That's what I say. Go to your local Walmart, Best Buy, whatever, and find a 50 inch or bigger HD screen with 1080 pixels and you'll find them for about $450. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most exciting thing in the world. Because they save energy, you can leave them on, they have great sound systems as well. You can use them to play music when you have to stay late in your classroom. Um, they just are, they, they are really important for, for uh, whole group in, instruction and experiences. So what do you do with it? Well, you plug a $100 Apple TV into it. That's what you do with it. And other stuff too. There's four HDMI ports, so you can plug a PlayStation if you want. But Then you get an articulating wall mount kit, so you can pull it out and move it any direction. And uh, get yourself a 16 gig iPad 2 for $350. That's what they cost now. And get a foam case, which I think you've got a case for years there, but there's a whole bunch of them now. And you've got a setup so that you can take that microscope or anything that you can see and turn it into a document cam. You can use it for plan to review, so let children make a fin finger sketch or do a doodle cast. It'll play through the speakers of that big screen. Mm. During work time, you go around and take pictures. When they, during recall time or when they're talking about what went wrong, what went right, you can put it up on the big screen. You've got Google, you've got Google Calendar, you can do all kinds of things with family connections with that field trip replay, and eBooks. You can tell stories either the traditional way by pointing the camera at a book or by um, the, um, an eBook. So, I like, again, I like this idea of, of theme-related iPads or just starting to develop that iPad collection. So, again, in that webinar, I talked about sort of the stages, the developmental stages that adults go through when they are hit with this new technology. So, those are beginner, emerging, and master. You'll find this on any report card. Um, and... A master is when you are using it sort of the way Bonnie and Diane described, but the, you, you, have the ex, you have an empowered adult who has the ability to put a lot of apps on or off that device at any time to match a child's interest. So if that child's into the Titanic, you can quickly pull some apps, you can quickly use, do Google image search, and you can support that learning with the technology. That's what a master does with any tool. And that's what you want to get the teachers to. Now, it doesn't happen by, it just doesn't happen. It happens intentionally. So what you do is, how do you foster development? Use your theoretical toolkit. So you have to first articulate how you think children learn and what is your curriculum. Then you got to give the teachers time to equilibrate to play with it, to break it, to test the limits. Just like we do with children. You have to let, you don't just become a Bonnie or Diane accidentally. You have to experiment and play. Encourage personal ownership of the device and make it safe. Make it a no judgment zone. There's no wrong answers. 
A wise person crawls before walking and has the skin knees to show for it. I made that quote up. I, I think it's a good quote. You should, somebody ought to tweet that. Um, but I think if Ben Franklin were alive today, um, that's what that would be the advice. You're going to get skin knees. I mean, there's things that don't go right with this technology. Also, you don't bake the cake faster by turning up the oven. You can't just throw the hardware out, throw in a couple days of staff development, and it just happens. And say, do it by Friday. It takes time. It might take two or three years, but know where you're going with it. And this came from the Catherine Cook School, uh, uh, and you know, it's the idea of visiting other schools and opening your eyes and seeing what what's do. You know, it's, this is a great time to get out of your own zone. And um, this is about the piano, and that is an expert is at anything was a beginner once. Watch the children. They, are, they will lead us through it. If you like what they're doing with the technology, if it feels right in the gut, it'll probably work. And there's a lot of stuff that you won't like as well. All right, so I've got seven minutes and 46 seconds to talk about magic. So I, I mentioned that there's a gazillion apps, and those apps are coming out like as we speak. This one just came out this morning. It's called ChatterPix. So you're the first to see this, I think. Um, my duck, duck, loose. Be afraid. So let's have a let's have a look at that one. Um, you know what? Before I do that, let me stick it up. Keep it out here for a second. Is there anyone that has some markers or crayons that you brought? No. No. Why would you have markers and crayons? Like I have a, someone with huge sacks full of markers and crayons from the exhibit hall. I just need now. someone to color this in and so, uh, sort of a bright design. Would someone come, come up here and help me out? Come on, just come, be courageous. Break out of your skin. Disequilibrate a little bit. Be wild and crazy. Well, if you... I don't have any. Really? Yeah, a, a ballpoint pen would work, too. Great. Orange, orange, yeah, help me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Draw a little yeah. sketch. It'll be worth it. Highlighter. Um, cool or highlighter. Because we're going to make a color. We're going to do a color, okay? It's down there on the, on the ground. Thank you, Craig. There. We're, you guys make a design. Work together. They're going to be demonstrating color mix in a second. I'm going to make that design. Um, just fill in the dot with something. Uh, another one here is Curious George Shapes and Colors. You can drag those things when your finger gets close to the, to the thing, so you get this pop, and it makes you feel super powerful. And then you make, that's the front of a train, and then you get to drive the train around. So it's, it blends play patterns in a very creative way. Curious George Colors and Shapes. This is color mix. Um, Easy Studio Animate with Shapes by Le Trois Ellis Interactive from France. It helps children understand how images move because it lets, gives them, turns your iPad into a little animation laboratory. For those of you that have clocks on the lesson plans, get Todo, T-O-D-O, -O, Telling Time. I don't need these, they just, that's how they come. Uh, by Locomotive Labs. Well worth the four bucks. Why? Because the main menu is an assessment screen. That's the main menu. You can see exactly the hard, the easy, and where I'm at, where my progress is. So I played the beginning level and all those. And this goes beyond, beyond time. It goes into calendars, seasons. You can drag a moon or a sun and see the, the light change. And this is the days of the week. And if, it, if you get it wrong, it just falls to the bottom. So it's a very gentle way for a child to explore skills. Bugs and Buttons 2 is out. Thank you guys. Oh, this is great. It'll be fun. Um, retinal display beauty, a buffet of pixels for a child to explore. And the, bu the bugs look so real. And nothing will motivate a child like a buzzing bee, right Gail? Some kids don't want to touch this. Yeah. So for the, and for the two-year-old or the uh, even younger, just getting started, get Sago, S-A-G-O, Mini Forest Flyer. You just fly that bird around, that's it. It's, it's got this thing called accidental success. 
you lean on it, it works. By the way, use this app with 40 or 50 year old staff members who are <laughs> terrified of an iPad. They can't fail. The bird flies around and does stuff. And then build with, remember I said about disequilibration. Uh, and then if you want to see some caviar of digital storytelling, get, download Little Red Riding Hood by Nosy Crow. And it does things like you see your sight, your, your face in a reflection of the water. Um, and then finally, the human body, well, two last ones, human body um, and uh, scratch. And then if for a treat for you and for the kids, you know, you've probably heard of Disney. Here's an app that shows them how Disney works. Oh, ABC Actions, we already talked about. Um, there's Walt Disney and, um, you know, there are 58 animated, or 53 something animated productions. Um, this app is called Disney Animated, it's $15, but it shows the actual process frame by frame of how Walt Disney made those, those and made a fortune off of um, motion pictures. How they work, and the process and the people actually behind them. So you can actually see um, Cruella, Cruella de Vil, and that's, those are the original sketches from 101 Dalmatians. And I think this idea of using the iPad to bring source material to the kids, the real thing, you can do that now, and I think that's, good. that's just really great. All right, so. Let's see that picture. So the first one I'm going to show here is called Color, and it comes from New Zealand. And I first saw this um, in the Catherine Cook School, and then, actually, I've seen this like five places, and then they were using it over in Holland. And um, it's called Augmented Reality, and you've seen this a lot. Um, So there is our drawing. Here you guys are. That looks pretty good. And that is your drawing that you guys made. How cool is that? Now if I touch this little thing in the bottom, I see your drawing superimposed over 3D. I think one thing that I hope you take away from this panel is moving into using the technology to empower, to empower the child. And I have some other things here. I'm going to try to move, stretch this a little bit. It breaks. I'm doing it on purpose. This is one I did before. When my worm comes to life, and I can get right in there and take a close look at this bird. Or I can look at you. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And then the other one I was talking about, what was the one um, that took the... Uh, Oh yeah, chatter picks. Let's look at that. No picks. Uh -oh. Yeah, you should say uh oh, Bonnie, because uh, you never know what's going to come out of this guy's iPad. Be, be afraid. <laughs> All right, there's two of them: chatter picks and chatter kid. I think I did that. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's, That's what scary. you can do with that. That's why you pay $500 for these devices. So you can torment your neighbors here in the town. I am so happy to be here as part of the bees. <laughs> That's sweet, isn't it? Yeah. Such sentiment. I've got to learn that one for next year. All right. Um, Boy, folks, we've got some apps to explore, and I've got it. I don't have any more time. Um, you know.
know, one of these days I got to do a session on apps because this always happens. Or like happy we, hour. We, we used to have an happy hour. Yeah. Well, come to our meeting tonight. Maybe we can squeeze an happy hour. But so, so let me just conclude with um, this. All right. And then we'll take some questions because we've got, actually, I don't know if we can take questions. But, well, um, we can take questions. Yeah, we'll stay around. And then tonight, there is also a meeting of the interest forum. From 6 to 7.30 in room 153. But let me, uh, before I depart, take the child's point of view. They will lead us through it. Mm -hmm. Get up, get down off your throne. I was just in Ireland, and I saw a real throne, and I thought it was cool. A real king sat in that throne. So I didn't get to sit in it, unfortunately. But give yourself a medal once in a while. This is the Order of St. Patrick. It worked back then. So reward your progress. If you make something work, show off a little bit. Make yourself feel good. Because this is hard work to figure out this stuff. And then um, I'll skip Piaget's big quote, but um, just to say, if Jean Piaget were alive today, he'd be adamant, as would Maria Montessori and others, Vygotsky and so on, the constructivists would be just shouting out loud with this, this theme of empowerment. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, to use this to help children develop their ideas. And to channel my inner David Weikert from high school, um, to remember that we're all early childhood educators part of a bigger mission. And that mission is to improve our culture, improve what humanity can do, and so I was, I've been traveling a lot, and I noticed this in immigration. And I found this shocking that we, you know, we live in this amazing, we have this amazing technology, retinal displays and so on, but what does it mean if 25%, uh, we have 25% of the world's prisoners? We have huge amounts of people behind bars. We have to figure out how to, how to empower people early on. We get them. We're the, we're the people that get them when they're young. So we have an opportunity to really help them feel powerful throughout their, their school life. So with that, I say thank you and thank you to the bees. Thank you, bees. And this, is, this was our sixth one. Yes. And do you have questions of anybody? And we can still hear and see. <laughs> So my gadget, you know, Mark did the uh, microscope. My gadget is that tripod up on that speaker. You see that? It has little bendable legs. Yeah. It's called, uh, I forgot the name, gorilla but something? it's a gorilla. It's, yeah, it's a tripod. Yeah, you can, so get one of those, because I, so I'm, the, the reason I'm saying this, I am, I taped it, I videotaped this. So I'll try to put it on YouTube. Last year's is on YouTube. Right. Because we want. No, 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 this is it. No, this is the one. But no. there is a wiki that we showed the uh, connection to. Um, and so if you go to, uh, let me just get the, uh, we tried to make this an easy URL. It's tinyurl.com slash ECE Tech 2013. That's no spaces, E-C-E-T-E-C-H 2013. Um, sure, it's tinyurl.com slash e c e t e c h two zero one three do you want the thing back you have a question yeah. can we project yeah. 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 Apps for Matt. Apps for Matt. one of my links is to some of our apps that we found that we use that are for preschool children for math so there's so many things we can't talk about, you know, early robotics, and there's a bunch of things that we couldn't touch on in our short periods of time. And so some of those URLs we'll put up on and the And we'd love to talk time. with you individually if you're interested. They like math apps. Thank you. Have a great Thank conference. Thank you. Yeah. The one that he just said, We've got, we have a yeah, well, link where we are putting all of our links. So my come in and stuff. I just I'll had one up I took That's down, and it's called, it's from Duck Duck Moose. But what is? We spend a lot of time looking at apps. Yeah, yeah, you get know, there. And I, I, it's called for a particular, everyone's looking for different groups, you know, for a different reason. I 
Yeah, we get a lot right. of that, though. And really? It's just something that we use around a kindergarten type. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at the motion map ones. Right. Can I get a card? And um, you can email me or go oh, on dear. my website. I'll just call me in for yeah, the book. It starts at home. Is that one of several yes. projects I'm that will sell? So I'm all interested, always interested in iPads and early childhood. For that one, right? Well, I'm here. I made it. That is a good thing. Yeah. So. Just look at a bunch. Yeah, there's a lot of garbage, but there's a few good ones. Like, check out the motion map, because they're more conceptually sound. And then there's a Columbia number, uh, fourth, fourth and fifth grade, uh, four, age four and five. Uh, Gail knows. Yeah, Columbia Teach College, it's called Teach Sleep. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting.
a project is called Chromium.